Welcome to the final session of Vontico's Dynamics 365 support webinar series. My name is Aaron Klein, a Vontico's marketing manager, and with me today is our featured speaker for this session, Vontico's managed services and strategic initiatives director, Chris Barbera. Uh, today's session explores how to property, properly utilize the subscription estimator for new and existing implementations to improve Microsoft Dynamics 365 finance and supply chain system performance. Now, Chris will dive deeper into the full session breakdown momentarily, but before he does, I just wanted to share with you a few of the other webinars that we have coming up. So, of course, today is the final session in the support series, but our three-part series, yeah, thanks, Chris, our three-part series um, on Dynamics 365 Finance Automation is just getting rolling. So session one was last week on credit and collections automation. If you'd like that recording, you haven't gotten it yet, you can just pop credit and collections in the chat. We'll be sure to get that to you. And then session two is next Tuesday, September 24th, exploring AP, autom AP automation and OCR, where you'll learn how to streamline your accounts payable process by automating data entry, eliminating errors, reducing delays and disputes, and enabling real-time insights with enhanced data accuracy. And then session three, which will be in the beginning of October, October 8th, will focus on advanced bank reconciliation. You'll discover how to utilize new features for generating customer payment transactions directly from bank statements, accelerating the reconciliation process with automated matching rules, and increase confidence in your bank balances and cash forecasting with timely account reconciliations. And I'll put the registration for this, the link, registration link for this series in the chat for all those who are interested, but you can also find it on our website under the under the um, about tab, as well as linked in this slide deck. And um, yeah, with that, Chris, you want to jump in, take it away? Sounds great. Excellent. I uh, just also want to mention that uh, it did run the one version update cadence session. Uh, I don't know, it was a couple of weeks ago, I think, Aaron. So if anybody has questions on uh, one version update cadence at the end, um, or you're interested in the recording, we do have that available, um, and uh, we can certainly help you put together an update cadence as well. But today we'll be talking about system performance specifically with the uh, subscription estimator. Great. So a little bit about myself. Uh, you'll see me also looking to the left and right a bit. I have two screens going and the, the camera's here. So if you see me looking around, uh, that's why. Uh, so I've been working with uh, ERP consulting for over 25 years in various roles. Um, when I first put this slide together, I had 15 years. I started calculating back, it's actually 25. So I guess I've been doing this a while. Uh, yes. Well, I started out as a developer. I've been a project manager, engagement manager, and then most recently for the past 10 years, part of the Advanced Code Managed Services team. Uh, about 15 years experience with Dynamics 365 and the various legacy versions, AX 2012, 2009 and such. In fact, you'll see some remnants of the AX 2012 uh, application when we look at the subscription estimator. So seriously, they have not updated it probably since that. Uh, successful implementations for Boeing, Healer Packard, Phillips Semiconductor. Uh, and now we're doing support for very publicly traded companies and privately held organizations ranging from energy infrastructure, experiential asset marketing, uh, artificial plant manufacturing to the largest KFC franchise in the US. So. Whatever industry you're in, Avantico probably has the experience with it. We're not just kind of put into just one particular vertical. Did set, celebrate my 10-year anniversary with Avantico last year. Uh, and as it comes to subscription estimators, we do offer this as a service to our support customers and also uh, as, a, as a standalone service. I think I've conducted about six of these uh, so far this year myself, along with others on our team. Uh, you'll see I'll try to give you as many tips and possibilities as I can today. Uh, but there are some more complex scenarios where it's more difficult to do it just on your own. So to also mention, we will set out the slide deck at the end, so you don't have to worry about taking notes. And if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and then uh, Aaron uh, will be kind of curating those, and we'll go over those at the end. And you'll have to keep me uh, on time here, too, just in case I start flipping. There's a lot of stuff to potentially cover on this topic, so I want to make sure I keep it as concise as possible. So. All right, so what are we going to go over? Uh, first, we're going to talk about generally what are the leading, leading causes of performance issues in Dynamics 365 and generally cloud-based applications in general. We'll go over what is a subscription estimator and then a couple of components, uh, the licensing count aspect of it, the transaction volume, and then I'll also intersperse here a couple recommendations as you start to fill out the subscription estimator. From there, I'm going to do slides up to that point, and then I'm going to actually uh, go into Microsoft Lifecycle Services and sort of demonstrate how to actually update your subscription estimator. Okay. 
All right, let's think about the leading causes of performance. We're going to talk about the subscription estimator, but most likely it's actually something else if you're experiencing uh, performance issues. I'll go through these kind of in, in a general uh, order of most likely causes. Um, and the top is custom code. So really, most likely it's inefficient custom code, either from, in rare cases, from Microsoft, more likely from custom code that's been put in your system, uh, maybe running non-indexed data queries, uh, excessive screen refreshes. Oftentimes we'll see a user interface where there's a calculated field that's being recalculated for every single field that's being, even if it's not being displayed yet, um, excessive looping and such. So those are usually the most typical causes of performance issues, especially if you're seeing it in specific areas versus just a general slowdown. The second one is interfaces, Ex slow external systems connected to D365. Think about it as something like you're creating a sales order and you have an external system that's calculating the sales tax. Well, if you, especially if you're calculating on every single line and it's slow, it's gonna make that overall, that entire sales order process look slow. And there's some testing we can do to see if that's the cause as well. Uh, configurations, uh, having enabling features that aren't really being used, but they're still being running in the background. Uh, running batch updates more often than needed is very typical uh, slowdown or not filtering reports before you're running them. For example, you only need the financials for the current year, but you just the default is it always runs for the past three years and you only look at the, the last few pages of the report or something like that. Uh, the next one is resources. This is where the subscription estimator can potentially help. These are things like insufficient memory, storage, compute power, things like that. And that's where we may be able to assist here. And then the last one, which is pretty rare, is networking uh, because the, the requirements are pretty low. Uh, if you have real high latency or low bandwidth connections, uh, D365 or Microsoft says your target should be uh, less than 250 milliseconds uh, for your connection and your bandwidth should be you know, 50 kilobits a second or higher. Considering people, some people have gigabit at home, typically these things are not going to be a problem. But if you're interested, you can go to azurespeed.com. Uh, and you can pick your data center, which is available in LCS, uh, and then it will run through it and kind of tell you what your, your bandwidth is and your latency, which can be helpful. Again, that's a very rare uh, occurrence though. Okay, so what is a subscription estimator? This is a tool in Microsoft Lifecycle Services. Uh, it was probably first created uh, when you actually did your initial implementation. And unfortunately, it's rarely ever updated. Uh, but this, along with your actual license count you've purchased from Microsoft, determines what resources you're going to get in your production environment. Uh, again, as I mentioned, most implementations, I see it often, they do the subscription made estimator, they've been live for a couple of years, and it's never been updated. And perhaps they did another acquisition, they've added users, but that's never been taken into account. Now, I'll also say the subscri subscription estimator is a black box. Uh, it's not where Microsoft says you put these values in it, you're going to get these resources. It's somewhat trial and error. Uh, it's based on looking at community research and such to determine what the likely outcome will be. So I'm going to give you my best guess on this, my best experience on this, but it doesn't mean that Microsoft, like you can put in certain values and you'll get a, a, a very specific result. Uh, and these edits I'm going to show you can make a significant difference in performance. We've seen it but it could potentially make no difference at all. Uh, the good thing is it doesn't cost anything to try it, uh, so you might as well give it a shot as long as you're uh, within the right uh, resource uh, allocation, which I'll show you in a few minutes. The next one is uh, that the results of changing this will likely not be evident for at least 48 hours. Uh, so just know that once you upload a change to the subscription estimator, you're unlikely to see the changes you know, immediately on that. So you have to wait a few days. Okay, one word of caution here before we get started. It is possible that Microsoft has overridden your resource allocations and given you more resources than what your, uh, what your subscription estimator would calculate out to. Uh, so in looking at that, I suggest first you look at what resources you already have. And if it sounds like from what I'm telling you today that you have a lot more resources uh, that you would based on your subscription estimator, you may want to contact Microsoft first, or you may just not want to make any changes to it. Ask your current partner or Avantico to help you out. We can look at it more in depth and see if there's if changing the subscription estimator is likely to benefit you. Okay. 
So how can you do that? If you go into Microsoft Lifecycle Services, you'll see on the, on the first screen on the right, you'll see your production environment. You can click full details. Then you'll bring up a page. You can scroll to the bottom, select environment monitoring, and it'll bring up this environment monitoring uh, page. Now, as you can see from many of the notes here, many of the analytics on this page have been depreciated. So this isn't a great resource to see how your uh, environment's actually performing, but there is one useful piece for us here. You go to health metrics and then you go to AOS. This will show what servers have been allocated by Microsoft into your production environment. AOS is essentially called what used to be called exact object server. Now I think it's application object server. Uh, these are the servers that are processing user transactions. And then you also have two that are that are transacting for batch activity. The base level you're going to get is two of each. So if you are seeing two of each, you know you have the, the essentially the lowest allocation. Uh, and then what we're what we're going to suggest today, you should be safe doing this because you're not going to ever get allocated lower than this. In, in contrast, I've seen customers that have six or eight AOSs and the same with batches, but they're doing very high transaction volume, and they also have a, a, a large number of users. Okay, so let's look at part one. This is updating your license count. Uh, now, research has indicated this is actually the most effective step in getting uh, additional uh, resources uh, because you're paying Microsoft money for these uh, users and you wanna make sure that they're allocated and that they're giving you resources for each of those. The good news is too, this is the easiest part of the update. So if you just said, oh, you know, I just wanna do something simple, part two looks complicated, I just wanna make this work, you could just do step one and potentially get some benefits, okay? So what you do here, and I'll, I'll show you this in a demo as well, but if you go to Lifecycle Services, you'll just pick the subscription estimator. You'll see at the top your current active uh, estimator uh, version. You click Edit Estimate, and you'll come up with this screen here on the right. So as you can see here, this particular environment, which is typical we see, is vastly under allocated. This customer has purchased 310 licenses, but they've only allocated 40 uh, to this instance of D365. So they're leaving basically resources on the table in this case. Uh, this is, can be often occurring because this has been set up when you first deployed your environment and perhaps through the initial record, you know, initial uh, purchase, you only bought 40 licenses, but over the first year, you added many more users in and now you have 310. Well, it's still only allocating resources for those 40. Okay. So what we do here is we'd wanna uh, allocate this full amount if possible. One caveat here, in the rare instance, we have a few customers like this, that you have two instances of Dynamics 365 production environments deployed in the same tenant, you do need to make sure you have resources allocated or licenses allocated to both of those. So you would not be able to pick your full record count here to put into the single instance. Each instance requires at least 20 enterprise users. And if there are questions as I'm talking, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll catch them at the bottom. I don't see any yet, but um, if you do, so. Okay, part two. This part's a little bit more involved. Uh, this is updating the transaction volumes. So it kind of builds a profile of your organization and how many transactions that you're actually uh, transacting in many different parts of the business to also determine your resources. So it's really four steps here. You're gonna download your active usage profile from LCS. You'll update those values. We'll upload that usage profile back to LCS, and then we'll mark that updated usage profile as your active profile. Um, is there, is anybody running retail or commerce that's on the call? If you are, you can just type it in the chat, just yes or something. There's a little bit different process if you're using retail or commerce. Okay, okay. Uh, well, if anybody has questions about it at the end, feel free and I can give you some updates there as well. It is also possible if you've been uh, live on D365 for a number of years, they have revised the usage profile template. Uh, every, I think it was maybe a year and a half ago or so. So 
if you try to re-upload the template you edit and there's a problem, um, I can show you at the end, there's a way to download a new template. You essentially copy your values over and upload the new template uh, uh, version. Okay. And there's some links here at the bottom of the page on how to do that. Okay, so during the demonstrations, what we're going to do, we're going to do the update license count first. This is the easier part. Open the license count estimate, maximize the values, uh, save and accept the warnings. And then part two, we'll download the current active uses profile, update those values, upload it back, and then we'll mark it as active. There's also some tips and tricks and suggestions here. Um, they're going to be in this deck. Um, but I'm going to go through these as I'm actually doing the demo because I think it, it, it's easier to understand when we're actually running the demo piece. Okay. All right. So let's go into LCS here. I right, hope I didn't get logged out. Let's see if this stays up. Okay, excellent. All right. So what I've done here is I've entered lifecycle services. I've pulled down this uh, menu here and I picked subscription estimator. What you're going to see here is your active and non-active subscription estimates. What you'll see here is your active estimate, uh, what date it was created on. As you can see, this original one was created on 2020. I have a few demos in here. Oh, actually, when I went into this environment, it was actually from 2020, so definitely needed to be updated. You'll see down here that it's giving you more detail about the active estimate. This is saying that only 70 enterprise users have been allocated, and it's also giving you some calculations here which unfortunately are black boxes to understand exactly what's here. But as you update your usage profile, I would note what you, numbers you have here and then go back afterwards and see if these numbers have updated. Okay. And you can also see some activation history here as well. Okay. All right. So for the first step, we'll look at the easier part, which is if you don't want to go through all the steps of downloading the template and making uh, changes to the transaction volumes, you can still potentially get a benefit by just selecting your active estimate here, going to edit estimate. It'll take a moment to load up. And then you can see this screen that I was showing you before in the screenshot. So in this case, I'm not going to allocate the full amount. I just want to so you can see because we do have multiple instances running. Uh, but if you had no other instances, you could allocate all 310 here. Okay. So I'm going to put 80 in, hit save. It's going to give me a warning here telling me that I could potentially change the amount of resources that are allocated to my system. Uh, in this case, I'm going to pick, that's fine. It's going to give me another confirmation message here in a minute. It's going to tell me the operation was successful. Okay. And you can see the enterprise uh, user count has changed. Uh, there's been no change in these transaction volume activity because I haven't changed the details within the attached uh, estimate spreadsheet. Okay, so that's that's the first part. I would recommend it. Most people should be able to do that, especially if you're only seeing two AOS servers and two batch servers uh, when you look at your production environment. That should be a very safe thing to do. Okay, so now let's look at the, the next step, which is part two, which is actually creating the, uh, updating the usage profile and transaction volume. So I'm going to go here, as you can see, this is my active estimate. I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna download a copy of my current estimate. So I would click here, user profile. It will download an Excel sheet. Um, I'm just going to show you what that looked like. It would download, and this is what you would see, this uh, this page here, okay, through Excel. All right, so I would, I would suggest starting on the, this instructions tab just tells you basically that you need to hit uh, enable content to use it. I would start with instance characteristics. You want to put in how many legal entities you're playing. Now, unfortunately, the wording on this is somewhat misleading. It's always asking it as if you're not deployed yet. So think about it instead as, you know, where am I at today? Or in some cases, where will I be in 12 months? So how many legal entities? I, again, I would answer, what, what are the number of legal entities you anticipate having 12 months from now? So you're not always constantly updating this. If you're thinking of an acquisition potentially in six months, essentially, I would, you know, again, then I would put this as two. Do you use manager reporter? How many customers across the enterprise? Again, if you have multiple legal entities, make sure you're counting all of them from all the legal entities. The same with vendors. Uh, inventory items that go live, I would say in this case, you could answer this, what do you, how many do you currently have? How many will be added each month? And then what do you expect to have at the end of the first year? So whatever your 
whatever you're actually filling this out, look one year in advance for that answer. And how many product assortments will you want there will there be? Again, think about what you have today, but I would actually look at if you anticipate it growing, pick the number where you think it will be in 12 months instead. Um, are you running MRP? This will be uh, estimated uh, components on a bill of material. Pick your most complicated bill of material when you're answering these next two questions, the one that has the most items on it. And then the second question that, that has the deepest uh, number of levels within your bill of material. Okay. okay, if you're not doing manufacturing, these aren't relevant to you. Uh, but if you are, please make sure you're picking the most complex ones. And I didn't see anybody say they're doing retail, but if you were, you would want to mark this as yes. Um, if you are, have done this previously and already had retail, you'd have another tab over here. This is retail and commerce, or you should, um, and there's be some additional questions there. Okay. Now let's look at peak transaction volume here. There's gonna be a lot of instructions on the page and you can read through these. I'm just gonna give you some of the highlights here on how to fill this out. Um, so let's, what it's going to ask you here is basically four different areas of the type of transactions you could have and then the various modules on the left that these transactions might be occurring in. Now you'll see in this example, this has very low numbers, 100, 200, 100, and zeros. Um, we have customers that have more over a million in some of these areas. So uh, don't let these low numbers, uh, uh, you know, if you have numbers much higher, you, you probably should, okay. So what you're gonna do is interactive is essentially you have users interacting with transactions or transaction lines uh, using the user interface. The next one is batch, if they're being processed through batch transactions. Uh, the next one here is integrations. Now DIXF is not, the, again, I mentioned, you're gonna see some 2012 uh, terms in here. Think about this, the data management framework instead of DIXF. So if you are importing or exporting uh, data through the data management framework, we'd like to put that here. And then essentially any other interfaces you'd want to put here, especially custom ones, EDI, um, you know, if you're using uh, an external data warehouse, you're exporting records there. You want to consider all of those in this in this slide here. Okay. Uh, let's see. The, the next thing is, okay, I mentioned that you want to look at 12 months of growth. The other important thing to think about here is this is not the number of sales orders. It's the number of lines. So in all of these, make sure you're considering lines. If you are manually putting in 10 sales orders an hour on your busiest time, they each have 10 lines, that's 100 lines. That's not, there should be 100 here, not you know, 10 for trans uh, 10 sales orders, okay? So you wanna aggregate up your, your busiest uh, hour when you're doing these each of these activities. So I also wanna bring up the point that this is looking for your peak transaction volume in a single hour throughout the entire year that one of the pitfalls is people say, okay, I'm gonna pick my busiest, uh, my busiest hour of the year, and now I'm gonna answer all these questions. Instead, you should be looking at for each question, what is your busiest hour? As an example, let's say uh, you know, 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific time on, after Black Friday is my busiest time for new sales orders. You wanna consider that time when you're answering the sales order questions. But let's say when we're going down to inventory, your highest processing for inventory is say two, every Saturday at 2 a.m. when you have a batch job run that's that's uh, doing cycle count updates or something like that. Then you wanna pick that hour when you're answering those questions, okay? Okay, so you'll go through each one of these here uh, for each of these types of interactions uh, through each of these modules and fill out information, okay? Then you'll come down here to financial reporting. And this is looking at not just the financial activity you may have done uh, in say general journals, uh, fixed assets and such. This is now also looking at when I do activities in these other areas, how many financial transactions am I potentially creating, right? So let's say you, you run MRP uh, and uh, you're changing information say on uh, ordering, that's fine. But say that you are uh, doing a projects transactions. Oftentimes project transactions also create financial transactions, right? Um, in the background. Well, consider those when you're filling out this area about other modules with finance impact. So this finance number should be at least the number you have here for your finance uh, activities right across the top, but also be taking into account other activities that could occur as well that have financial impacts for the same here as well. 
Over here, you want to pick your peak number of management reporter reports, if you're using that, that, you, that users could be opening in one hour. Think about across the entire organization, all legal entities, your busiest hour, uh, that's maybe you know a month end or year end activity, something like that, where you're running a lot of those. You'd want to put the highest number in here. Okay. All right. Okay. So from there, uh, you will save the update. We'll go back in to let's see here. We would go back into the subscription estimator here in LCS. We'd select new estimate. Um, I typically want to put the make sure you put the date in here. I would say like uh, just in case I'll put demo three. I usually like to put the date that I created it. It will be timestamp, but it's still a bit easier this way. I find uh, if you're looking at keeping these in a in a separate file, not just an LCS repository or something. Uh, I hit next. Browse. I will pick uh, the one that we've been an example of one we've been editing, uh, and then I'll upload this. Hit create. It's going to give me some messaging here in a moment. This messaging is basically saying it's been uploaded, and if you mark it, you need to mark it as active for it to have an impact on the business. Okay. All right, so I selected, you can see here my active estimate has not changed, but the one I just uploaded is available here. So I'm going to do this one here. I'm going to mark it as active. Let's say yes. All right, and it's been activated. Now you'll see that when you're creating a new one, one of the other benefits is by default, it is actually reallocating the uh, the license count. Uh, you can see it's maximized the license count that's available uh, when I've created a new estimate. Um, and older estimates and processes didn't do that. So now you have your your uh, your new estimate up. It's going to take at least 48 hours uh, you to see any benefit from it, uh, but it also makes sure that your licenses have been allocated. So let's go through the tips. Let's make sure I talk through all these. I want to yeah, remember you're look, try to look out 12 months from now when you're actually answering the questions. Remember it's transaction uh, lines. Uh, so 10 sales over the 20 lines is 200 transactions. Use your peak hour um, for each answer. Uh, and then consider uh, throughout its life. So this one I didn't bring out. This is important to also consider. Say for instance, you have uh, e-commerce, uh, and you have a process that brings in a thousand e-commerce lines into a, 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 a staging table. Then you have a user that manually reviews those thousand order lines and says, yeah, I approve them, they look fine, and marks them for approved. And then you have a batch job overnight that actually takes those all those approved lines from your user and process them to create uh, approved sales orders. That's 3,000 transactions, not 1,000. 1,000 for the import, 1,000 user interaction, and 1,000 batch stop activity. So it's important to think about your transactions life cycle, not just straight record count. Uh, I think I mentioned this one already. It may say DIXF as a legacy uh, relationship there to 2012, but you should be looking at data management framework work when you're filling out the details on the, uh, on the subscription estimator spreadsheet. All right. Great. I think we're just about right on time. Uh, we should be about 30 minutes so far. So great. Okay. Uh, Aaron, do we have any questions? Anything we can answer for anybody? Uh, it doesn't look like there's anything in chat right now, but um, okay. if you guys do have any questions, feel free to hop off mute right um, and, and ask Chris directly. It is a complex topic. If anybody's using uh, commerce or you're just looking at it and saying, uh, wow, I see a whole lot of AOSs and batch AOSs and I'm concerned I might lose some resources, we're also happy to take a quick look for you. Um, you know, just put, uh, if you have an interest, just go ahead and put it in the chat and we can set up some time uh, to help you and look at it. It just takes a few minutes, so um, happy to help. Thank you so much for everybody for joining. Thank you, Chris. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, we'll put the recording together for this and um, we'll share the deck as well here shortly. Um, but yeah, don't hesitate to reach out. And if you did pop off mute and want to say anything, feel free.